Okay, guys, the internet has requested and the gods have complied. I have with me Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Before I say hello to him, let me tell you a very small part of his CV. He's the Distinguished Professor of Risk Engineering at New York University, the best-selling author of many books. Let me list uh, some of the more popular ones and some of the less popular ones. Dynamic Hedging, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, The Bed of Procrustes. I had to learn how to pronounce that word. Anti-Fragile, his most latest skin in the game, and one that's forthcoming, The Logic and Statistics of Fat Tales. His official title also is he is the Greco-Phoenician Grand Emperor of Bullshit Slayers. And in, in as to demonstrate my allegiance to him, I will now do a an Arabic, or not Arabic, non-Arabic, non-Arabic cry. Bil-roh, bil-dem, nifdik, ya nasim. How are you? Okay, very, very good. Now you definitely proved that you uh, you are Phoenician, uh, God. <laughs> so I have, I have two, two points. Uh, the first one is effectively you missed, because you had a lot of titles, you missed the central one. Okay. I was a trader for 24 years. True. Okay. So, and, and uh, you know, traders know that the behavior of traders, I'm, uh, compared to other traders, I'm not even uh, um, as outrageous as... Uh, as, as well, being, like. a trader, being a trader gives you the street creds, right? So you're not just sort of some Ivy League uh, Yeah, I think, but, but in other words, uh, the traders have a very, very uh, low threshold. Uh, right. You see, when you see BS, they go. And the second one is all my books. I to simplify, I made them one called Inserto. So yes. you don't have to worry about about saying all of these books. One book Inserto. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. As we're starting, since our conversation is likely to take a stochastic, non-linear trajectory, I'd like yeah. to start off with a little Jewish prayer, if I may, to protect me from the stochasticity of our conversation. Okay. Right. There we go. Now I'm protected. Go. Very good. Okay, but let me tell you also, it's beautiful to hear someone with with a real accent, the Mizrahi accent. Shukran, uh, Habibi. Yeah, uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to start uh, just on a personal note, because many people may not know this, and I don't know how much you actually know the story. My history with your family goes back to well before you and I uh, met and got to know each other. It was in 1990 when I first began at Cornell University. I had an, a fellow MBA student when I was doing my MBA at McGill tell me that, hey, you're going to Cornell, you should look up this uh, fellow Lebanese, the whole Lebanese mafia was working. Uh, his name is Karim Talib. Uh, and you know he's a great guy. You you guys will get along uh, wonderfully. And so I reached out to him, and I remember he came over to my house. We had just met to t to talk to you about the hospitality of the Lebanese. We had just met. Basically, I, I'm useless when it comes to putting things together. I have zero ability to put furniture together. He came over and assembled my uh, desk, which I then worked on during my PhD. So Karim Khalib, if oh, you're listening. Ask you, now now that, that, okay. Do I get some credit for it? In of case course. You pay him back. Can you pay me back instead? <laughs> Absolutely. You get all the credit. Yeah. And actually we used to, before I got a, a chance to meet you and chat with you and so on, uh, but then I had learned of you, uh, you know, he would tell me fun stories about you and so on. And so, so I knew uh -huh. of you well before I got to meet you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, one, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that your guidance uh, knew about it. <laughs> uh, Habibi, let's start with your latest book. Uh, for those, it just came out very recently, so many people may have not had a chance to read it, it yet. Actually, yesterday, this is Skin in a Game, and I was in the process of reading it this morning. But did you find any typos? I, I did, actually. <laughs> I will tell you which ones. Oh, very good. Uh, other can find them, yeah. Uh, tell, us, tell us the big the big gist of the book. Okay, the, the, the whole idea is, as you know, I mean, you're an economist or in some way, uh, there's that notion that economics is about incentives, okay? Some people uh, realize, but, but there's not much in the literature, that economics is about disincentive. And the disincentive aspect uh, predates, of course, anything we've done. It's the first rule ever, Hammurabi's law. You, thou shall, if an architect builds a house, the house collapses, and uh, whatever, the architect is accountable. It means that you cannot stack someone with risk and run away from it. Okay? And I call that in trading the Bob Rubin trade. <clears throat> the people, he, you stash Citibank <coughs> with all these tail risks, 
and then walk away with a hundred million dollar bonus and uh, compensation. And uh, and then later on, uh, when when Citibank collapses, you say it was a black swan, you know, after a very very stubborn author. <coughs> so that's number two understanding of skin in the game. I went one step beyond. And now there's a third aspect to skin in the game, to that idea of symmetry between, uh, you know, people that you as an evolutionary theorist will, I'm sure, uh, like. And, and of course, you will find something that will help me prove it. And it's as follows. If you drive on a highway, even in Lebanon, okay, you can run into a person who can kill 30 people who have enough wackos in life. Why doesn't it happen that often? People, crazy drivers, well, simply because these people are dead. Right. Okay, or uh, whatever, they, they've had an accident, they're paralyzed, or, or they they're, uh, lost the right to drive. So what happened is that those who inflict risk on others, who also inflict the same risk on themselves, tend to leave the gene pool. Right. And that's the central idea, is that contact with reality is a fort via survival. So there is an equilibrium. Okay, so warmongers historically were warriors themselves, and as a matter of fact, they were more courageous. They had they took more risk than the regular person. Yeah, they're not drone drivers five thousand miles away from where they're going to drop the bomb. Exactly. Oh, they're not working for a policy office here. Uh, you know, uh, advocating for war, invasion of Iraq, another invasion of this, while sitting in an air conditioned office and not paying the price. They paid the price. So you had an equilibrium. These people filtered out because, of course, qui vit de la guerre meurt de la guerre. He, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So that was that's a, that's the third aspect. Now that third aspect, you can take it deeper into a lot of directions. And the most important one is let's take academia. Okay, a plumber is judged by other plumbers. <laughs> Okay, a uh, uh, bus driver, uh, sorry, a plumber is not judged by other plumbers, he's judged by his clients. A bus driver is judged by, of course, his accident record and by reality, by the customers. A, uh, anyone, a, a gynecologist is judged by the insurance company and the clients. Okay, there's a check. But there are fields, okay, where academics or people, professionals are the ones judging the professionals without contact, without any contact with reality. Now, it so happens that academia is unfortunately subjected to the, this problem. Now, of course, there's some segments of academia where you have science, you have results, you have uh, like mathematics, it's very rigorous. You can't really uh, uh, divert too much and, and create nonsense. But if 20 of us got together, created a field, created a journal, and called it the A Journal of that profession, and started, got into a citation rank, Okay, we can say the craziest stuff, and it's still it'll still be successful within that echo chamber. Exactly, it will it will work very well, and we'll go to your university and ask uh, you know uh, uh, for someone to start a department. We'll get funding, and and your state, I'm sure Trudeau will give us funding, and and then we'll we'll start something about uh, gender physics, for example, whatever whatever you want. Okay, so this is the problem of some fields. So the the, the skin in the game is about the symmetry in all its aspects, whether empirical, moral, you see, moral, in fact, that sure. if, if, uh, if, if I, I want to treat you the way you treat me or something like that, I don't want to mistreat you if I don't want to be mistreated by someone, you know, who can have power over me and stuff like that. Uh, when you were talking earlier about sort of the academic echo chamber, I could offer a personal example to that because when I, would, when I was first setting out to demonstrate how we could... Uh, you know, Darwinize uh, the business school in general and consumer behavior in particular, uh, I received a lot more uh, blowback or obstacles, if you'd like, from academics as compared to practitioners. The practitioners would listen to my stuff and say, yeah, sure, that makes perfect sense. If you want to understand how to develop an effective advertising message, you need to tap into evolved human nature. It is the academics who were wedded to their own paradigms, who felt that if biology boy came on his horse, then they would be out of a job. So they were the ones who, would, who were a lot more vociferous in attacking my ideas than the practitioners. So it exactly speaks to your point, correct? Yeah, I mean, you, your problem is you're in an unfortunate position because you're judged by administrators, not by your clients, right. and whatever your client is. Clients are effectively those who read your papers and implement them in practice. Everything else is intermediary. So. 
That is unfortunate, but of course, um, I'm glad. Plus, I'm, I'm very proud of you as a co-Phoenician, um, you know, uh, from someone from my uh, from the tribes, uh, that 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 you managed uh, uh, to to be absolutely no nonsense in a world where <laughs> no nonsense is uh, considered a vice. Shukla, so, habibi. What are the biggest the courage? Uh, also, the courage to stand. This is skin in the game. So, skin in the game. Really, when I I was reading it this morning to see if the message really is coming through, and it's coming through. Skin in the game is about honor. Courage and sacrifice. Exactly. If you don't right. take risks for what you do, you're nothing. That's skin in the game. And which, by the way, speaks to, and I, I want to get back to how we dis discuss skin in the game in the context of academia. But yeah. uh, one of the ways that I would easily link it to some of the evolutionary ideas that I cover in my own work is that for a signal to be, uh, you know, diagnostic, it needs to be costly. And hence, is a Havian signaling. And so, so that's exactly what you're saying because I heard you at one exactly. point. Exactly. Bingo. Right? Bingo, you got it. Because I have a chapter called The Merchandising of Virtue, where I say the only virtue is courage okay, that cannot be faked, faked is courage. courage. Exactly. Okay, because all the other virtues uh, are fake. You see, that, and, the Havian virtue, it is, it is incredible. We should probably sit down and, and, and write a draft together. Or yalla, yalla, jay. Uh, uh, I actually give an example. I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, I, I, I know that you, you, you have copies of my book, but I don't know how closely you've read them, if at all. In, in, in at least one of my books, if not several of them, I talk about the end goal, rich, the end goal, N apostrophe G-O-L. It's on the island of Vanuatu, where these guys are called land divers. So they go up on a platform that's 80 to 100 feet high. You tie vine ropes to their feet. And to demonstrate that they are courageous, they have to then jump off head first straight down where their heads are about to splatter on the and it, just a few inches before it splatters it stops them well you can't fake that courage right if all it took to demonstrate that i'm a warrior is for me to do 10 push-ups then the the ladies would never know who's the real warrior versus the fake but the fact that it is so over the top heroic is what makes it honest signal Exactly. I mean, I, I actually, you know, it's, it, in, in, in social life or in my own life, I've, do, I've decided to use one metric. If a person is famous, okay, or a person has an audience and is not going against some kind of power, that person is a BS vendor. Right. Very simple. So in other words, if you're not, if you're not fighting someone more powerful than you, Okay, and you'd be taking that. I see no, no evidence of, of courage. So saying, you know, saying something that is expected from you is, is there's zero exhibition of courage. So is it, is that what what draws the ire from you towards some of the common the some of the people that we we both know who would be considered no, friends of mine by whom you would hate? Is that what is that the no, reason? Yeah, but but they're not the the all BS vendors are the target of my ire. You may have some kind of association with people who are not like you, right? Basically, um, these these people, but they're not, uh, and they will go by packs. You don't go by packs. You go against, uh, you know, they go by packs. They have uh, followers, uh, but the uh, the idea is, is as follows: it, any, anything anything you do that doesn't entail risk taking is not an action, right? And so, and and, and uh, to continue with the, with the thing, so I started thinking about it, and it hit me that I felt better about myself. When I'm under subjected to a, a smear uh, attack, in a sense, it's a form of anti fragility, right? You have exactly. to face the stressors to grow. No, but not just that, and also because because it means I'm bothering someone, I'm doing something. Okay, <laughs> you, I'm taking risks for for whatever cause I am I'm following, and I feel better about myself, and I don't feel good about myself when I'm subjected to a reverse of a smear attack. Everybody's saying good things. That, that, that didn't feel good about myself when I wrote the Black Swan. Uh, initially, okay, some people hated it, but but after the crisis, I was like uh, someone who walked on water. I hated it. Right. You see, I feel better. Not that I mean, I like, uh, of course, uh, you know, to get recognition, but there's something about uh, uh, that, that 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 persona standing and getting applause, you know, and not taking any risk. So, of course, I took more risk even after with the Black Swan by some other friends of yours or some other people by attacking them. But the, the, uh, um, to go back to that core thing and in human nature, that Zahavism, I tried even to apply it to religion. 
Right. And something very, very strange is I, I kept wondering, why is it that the, the Christian religion kept insisting on having the Christ man and God? And that's a theology that nobody could accept. Okay. So I thought about it. I said, well, there's something about Greek gods. Greek gods always have scars. Okay. Or oh, Greek gods always get in trouble. A pure God, the way it okay, doesn't get harmed. It's sort of like you walk on a tightrope, but there's you know protection in case you, you you can't be harmed. So they wanted the Christ to suffer, okay, to have skin in the game. But, but by yeah. suffering, it's a costly yeah. signal to his exactly. moral piety. It's interesting. Exactly. That... And, and skin in the game. And then the other thing, it keeps coming back. But let me give you another dimension. Sure. And I, I just saw it, and this idea came to me. Uh, uh, twice, but 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 the most vividly, when when I was looking at Trump debating his uh, the other thirteen empty suits, and to me they looked like empty suits, <laughs> okay. And and Trump, whatever it was, he looked like uh, uh, someone alive, right? It was not empty. Whatever was there, you hate it or love it, but right. but whatever it was, okay. So I kept thinking, what was the problem, okay? And effectively. It was that Trump had been attacked. Someone showed the guy lost a billion dollars of his own money. So you look at someone, you say, he has scars. Yeah. There's something honorable about losing. Maybe it's not true. Maybe Trump was faking it. That's not the point. The point is that having lost a billion dollars of your own money made you real as compared to pencil pushers. And that the American public definitely detected in the election. It's the same costly signaling yeah, you know what? I, at least I'm human. I take risk. Okay, costly signal. I'm still here. I lost a billion dollars. So it's sort of like those scars that Roman soldiers would exhibit by showing, "Hey, I was in battle. How about you?" So not only is costly signaling relevant in explaining uh, the attraction that people felt toward Trump, but yeah. if you and I, as academics, demonstrate any positive response to Trump, that itself is a costly signal. <laughs> Of course, of course. It means, hey, come get me, all right? So, and, and also, it means that I don't have to worry about your uh, uh, fitting your criteria. So, and, and actually, you and I, as, as, as people who write, let's say, not just academics, every negative review, you see, every attack on us augments that. Right. Because, uh, and, and let me give you a very simple anecdotal thing. Uh, I, I, I've just got an email saying that my book is number seven in London, okay, on the bestseller. And the bestseller list has books like, you know, for, for that, that, they, you, you, that you would probably stop reading after age four and a half, that, that kind of stuff. And then my book is very hard to read for them, but that, that category. That's the Sunday Times section. A biography of athletes usually is, is, is what makes it. So, and actresses. So the, uh, and I was wondering what was happening, you know, all my reviews in London were horrible, were attacks, <laughs> okay? But they were attacks, okay? So it's just the dimension of anti-fragility that you seem to bring with your, your, your costly signaling, right? Beautiful. If that book is still sold in spite of the attacks, all right? It means it can sustain. Right. Attacks. Now, now in, in, so one of the chapters in your book, or one of the, pa not passages, but I guess chapters, you uh, in the latest book you talk about the minority rule uh which you you had, you had mentioned that you'd love for us to talk about today and then i pulled out because as i was reading uh that that passages in, in your book those passages it reminded me of something that i wrote as part of a canadian senate testimony which i'd like to read first yeah, go ahead. Uh, and then because it's going to so beautifully fit with what you wrote so this is uh, for those of you who don't know i i gave uh uh, I testified in front of the Canadian Senate regarding Bill C-16, the gender identity and gender expression issue. And at one point, I say the following. Ongoing governmental efforts are pushing for a gender-neutral society to cater to an extraordinarily small number of non-binary or non-gendered people who feel marginalized at having to provide their biological sex as part of their profiles. This is the tyranny of the minority. 99% of the population should acquiesce to having a default feature of their personhood erased because a few individuals might be inconvenienced by it. That's exactly your minority rule, isn't it? 
yeah, yeah, exactly. When you have a symmetry, and and it works still, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, and and you want me to give the background? You like? Yeah, to go ahead, go ahead. But some people okay. might not know what it is. Yeah. Okay, so it it it, uh, it and and. Uh, and the beauty of this is that it can take us into evolutionary ter uh, territory and into collective versus individuals. Uh, I was at a, uh, I was setting up the, uh, uh, the barbecue at the Complex System Institute, okay, and we're inviting people to talk to them about complex system. And I learned one thing, ironically, at that barbecue: a bunch of people from Jerusalem came, all right, to the uh, barbecue. To talk about com complexity, and they, they were very, very uh, religious. Uh, you can see they were very religious. And I was helping with the, the stand, the lemonade, the, the, the food, and I felt, oh boy, because I was among the people who were helping. I said, oh boy, I made we made a mistake. We don't have kosher food for these people. So I, I was wondering how to get out of that difficult situation, till one of them. A religious Jew said, "Oh, don't worry about it. It's all kosher. The lemonade, don't worry. The drinks, oh, they're going to be kosher. What? Yeah, they're kosher. What do you mean they're kosher? We, I bought them. Uh, no, they're kosher. So we looked at it. At the bottom, it was written kosher. So effectively, 0.3 percent of the population of the United States is kosher, and close to 100 percent of soft drinks are, right. <laughs> including Coca-Cola. Why? Because very simple." Your Coca-Cola, right? And you're making a drink. You make it kosher. You got to make it kosher, not kosher. Merchandising this uh, different truck, this uh, different shelves. No. What do you do? You make them all kosher because I can drink kosher, all right. But the kosher person cannot drink non-kosher. And hence, an, that's the that's the asymmetry. Exactly. Very simple asymmetry. <laughs> And and uh, that asymmetry, you start looking at its effects of the asymmetry. Uh, for kosher drinks, it's obvious. The cost is small. Sometimes if the cost becomes large, then you don't have that asymmetry. Okay? And and you look at the effect of the asymmetry in consumer uh, decision. If someone coming from Mars, looking at the behavior of Americans, uh, he would say, well, people are uh, uh, religious, uh, glad kosher in this country, right? From, from Mars, because they don't know the detail. So there are a lot of things we can infer from it. The first one is that a minority can impose its will on you. Okay, if 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 they're intolerant, and the second one is that, and that's uh, harder to discuss now. It's uh, explained at length in the book. It takes a while to get it. Is that much of ethics comes from the fact that we have laws. You know, you know, it becomes from a, a few very very ethical people. Right, so what, what, that, that goes against the, the folk intuition that there would have had to be consensus, there would have had to be a majority agreement. Exactly, it, it, because, because just, and this I got it from studying uh, halal, all right? Mm -hmm. And I noticed that, okay, if you a person eats halal, uh, he will not eat non-halal, but the reverse. And I, then I noticed that, and, and you know very well, um, the, the, in, in the, Sem the Semitic languages, or that Semitic language called... Uh, Arabic uh, that halal means means uh, legal, right? Halal or haram? Halal, of course, it means illegal. So, so I looked at it. I said, well, it's not just food to which this applies; it's right. also what is permissible, what's not. You see, like uh, theft, mail haram. You see, you can't touch it. Okay, stolen merchandise, you can't touch it. You see, so you, you, you understand. So it took me, I started doing uh, experiments, uh, playing with a computer and, and taking long walks, which is be beats the computer, and then thinking about it that as follows, right? Let us say that we have two methods of poisoning a crowd, okay? One method is, is you put a drop in, in the drink, either it kills you, all right? Uh, 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 the smallest drop kills you. That's a minority rule. In other words, I have this coffee here, if I put cyanide in my coffee, all right, uh, it will it would be coffee with cyanide. No matter how much coffee I add to it, it will still be it's a minority rule, same effect, okay, up to a point, of course. So, and then the other method is you give something that has 50% chance of killing you, okay, it's stochastic uh, uh, or property, whatever consensus properties, and then you you uh, 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 conditional on that, then 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 you're told that half the people died. You know, it's not the minority rule. They're right. not a cyanide. And if, if you're told that everybody died or everybody's alive, 
you know it's a minority rule. That's good. That's good. When I was reading uh, that particular chapter, uh, I was thinking, wait a minute, this is exact. what he's talking about is exactly the mechanism I have used to explain the dangers of the slow Islamization of the West. And then lo and behold, as I read further, that's exactly what you talked about. But before I, 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 uh, I ask, I see the floor to you. In uh, one of my uh, converse, public conversations with one with you, with your very very good buddy, very good friend Sam Harris, be nice, Kun Latif, Kun Latif. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I was on his show and I was ex I was explaining to him that the, the the key danger when we're discussing immigration doesn't come from the fact that we have to stop a few radical ISIS people. Of course, we have to do that. But the much greater danger when you take a longer temporal view of the issue is that once you slowly Islamize a particular ecosystem, then it's only a matter of time with a very few number of people to then... And then I actually, I don't know if in his case, I had used the example of, of Coptics, uh, you know, Copt in, in Egypt. Yeah. But there are many cases where... Uh, a country was not Islamized through the sword. It was shwayye, shwayye, bit by bit. And that's exactly what you talk about. So maybe you could expand on that. Okay. So so what happened for the minority rule to work, <laughs> you need to have um, uh, a, a, an open system, not a mountainous area. So, and, and, uh, and you need to have, say, distributed, distributed in the whole country. It's not local. You see, you need to have that kind of thing. It so happened that in the Levant, where we're from, Levant is mountainous and, and people don't mix. But in Egypt, that's open, it so happened that people intermarried a little bit. And there is a very simple Islamic rule. Once you're in, you can't get out. And if any of the parents is uh, Muslim, the children are Muslim, all right? So it simplifies. So what happens at very slow rate of, very, very slow rate of conversion moves the population from 5% to 95%. Right. Maybe 97 now. I mean, they lie about the statistics, but something. So, and all it takes is just a little bit of conversion, not much, a small rate of conversion, because it's not stochastic. It's stochastic maybe, but it's not reversible, you see? So, so it goes, it's like an absorbing barrier, mathematically. So when you look at, you back out from the Markov chain, what, what you get, you realize you need very small probability, very small rate of conversion will give you after 1300 years, okay? A majority. For example, that's one. Effectively, Egypt had other things going for it, which is that, and, and then in my definition of religion, let me start by saying one thing. When you say Islam, I don't hear Islam. But to me, that's not Islam because uh, I, I know Shiite, Shiite Islam is a complete different religion, uh, much more tolerant and not a problem, and it doesn't have these same minority rules. And, uh, and it's Wahhabi Islam. And effectively, what has happened to Islam over the past 50 years is an Islamization of Islam itself, or Wahhabization. And I, I remember, um, okay, you were in Lebanon as a kid, I was in Lebanon as a kid. The way I recognize a Muslim woman from a Christian, Christian one is Christian women, particularly like uh, uh, old uh, Babu, you know, Babushka, old Russian grandmother, the Orthodox, would dress conservatively with a headband. And Muslim women didn't have any right, because right. that was not part of the religion. It was some kind of, okay, so that's the first statement I'd say. The second one is that you have to interpret Islam not as a religion, but as a legal system. And so I have my chapter on the legal system. It's what we say religion is not religion. Christianity is not a legal system because when it came, it was built at the time when the Romans had monopoly of law. So the, the Christianity never really managed to be legal, even when it was a theocracy at some point, and it was never part of the legal system. They had separate courts, whatever it was, whereas Islam is legal. It's not a religion, it's a legal system. And Judaism was initially a legal system and then became both tribal, Islam, the same, but universal, okay? And you can understand that from, we know from languages, deen in Hebrew means <laughs> law, Deen in Arabic means religion, which right. means that it's not religion, right? So, and, and in Aramaic, you say, you don't say deen for religion, you say nomos, which is law, uh, for law, nomos, the, the Greek word for nomos. So, you have to, so you have to realize what, what happened with, um, over time, is that the Turks really took Islam without really taking much of the law. Right. They had their own, uh, they hold kanun and, 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 and work with it. So it was, it was a different religion. It's a complete different religion that was Wahhabized by the Saudis 
over the past 50 years and made them tolerant. And the minority rule works right there. If I put a Wahhabi, you put a Wahhabi with 30 non-Wahhabi people. It's only 30, a matter of time, yeah. The 31 will behave like the Wahhabi. You see, that is a problem. So, so there are some tricks. And actually, what we have to do the work is not here. It's just weakening Saudi Arabia's aims to change their own the people within their own religion. That's well, it. And I, I would say when you drew, I, I love your, your analysis of the topography of Egypt versus uh, Lebanon. And that because of the unique topography of Lebanon, it doesn't allow the minority rule to take as much of an effect. Now, mm -hmm. I will draw an analogy between the topography and I will, I will argue that the ideological topography in the West of being so open, being so tolerant, in a sense, that creates the flat ground. You don't have mountains of ideological defenses against that which should not be tolerated. So in a sense, we are the Egypt of that dynamic when it comes to the ideological topography. Do you, do you, do you agree? I more than agree on one point, the EU. That's my problem with the EU. I was trying to explain why in complex system you need pockets. You see? So in, uh, America is not a country. It's not a republic. America is a federation where basically the states can do whatever they want. Okay? It's a collection of states. That blocks the North rule. Right. If you universalize. So what happened in Europe when you have pockets, small states, city states, each one will have its own rule. The minority rule will not spread. Right. But when this thing come from the top, and now the EU is imposing ideas from the, you see, that, that's a problem. It's opening up the system too much, which is, and now you should probably explain it to proponents of Brexit. I was going to say, you should talk to your boyfriend, uh, Richard Dawkins, about Brexit. Yeah, 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 my friend, yeah. He's anti Brexit, I assume, yeah? <laughs> All of the right things. I, I don't know how you have friends with these people, but anyway. That's, well, well, that's, I guess... Uh, that's a private con let's keep this to a private conversation, right? Yeah, what's good? Okay, uh, let's move on. I wanted to spend well, okay, bef before we move on the minority rule. So, clearly, the dynamics of the minority rule as applied to say the spread of Islam in the West could just as easily be applied to social justice warrior dynamics on campuses. You yeah, have a very, very small minority who are very vocal, and so. The optics is that everybody is a rabid social justice warrior on campus, which of course is not the case. Most just want to go about studying their biology and psychology and business, but the few very small can completely grab the narrative, correct? Is that same, same idea? Yeah, more, more, even, you know, I'll go even beyond by saying the following. Uh, uh, pretty much everything you see on campus is determined by a small number of individuals, okay, who are costing your parents or the, or the parents uh, thousands of dollars of hard-earned money to just have a diversity officer and all of that thing. People just want to study something technical. It's going to kill universities. But there's one interesting thing with the minority rule, and I'll use the Christians as, as, as part of that. You know, halal is neutral okay, today because you don't know about it. But as people detect the minority rule, they start rebelling. Right. And there is an actually Arab poet that you'll never read in any Arab country. Or, or so-called members of Arab League country, and, and but we know because he was Christian. And he said, I will not eat sacrificial lamb. Mm. Okay, I will not eat uh, uh, meat that is, uh, okay. And then he will say, what? It turned out that it, 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 you know, they refused the, the halal as identity because the Christians actually were force-fed sacrificial meat. Right during uh, the Roman Empire as, as punishment for Christian, and some of them would die of starvation. Okay, they say, I'll die of starvation and would not open my lips. How is that for a costly signal? That, that, that's exactly. So, so some people have rebelled against minority rule. Minority rule is only, bad, only works when it's sneaky. As I said, it was a reversible rate of conversion. But the, the, the minority rule, if it's too visible, and if you make it visible to people, they automatically rebel. Well, incidentally, that there's there's a concept in uh, well, originally in psychophysics, which then has been applied in marketing. This is the idea of the differential threshold or the just noticeable difference. So, for example, if I'm a company that's selling candy bar and it costs a dollar for a hundred grams for the candy bar, I'd like to increase the price. But if I increase the price, that's too salient. So I'd like to then decrease 
the, the weight of the candy bar. So if it's at 100 grams, I'd like to find out how much can I reduce it so that most people don't notice the difference, right? So if it's at 100 grams, maybe if I reduce it to 95, nobody can pick up that five, five gram difference. But if I reduce it by 10 grams, everybody will pick it up. So that concept of just noticeable difference is used in marketing when you either want people to notice a change or if you don't want them to notice a change. And that's exactly what you're saying, because in the case of Islam, well, if we can see this little thing, what's the big deal? So it falls below the just noticeable difference. And then one day you wake up, it's the old uh, parable about the boiling frog, right? One day you wake up, boom, we're 95% Islamic, correct? No, I, 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 first of all, Islam, there's a lot of Islams. It's Wahhabi Islam that is Fair enough. intolerant. Okay, so this is what I'm saying about the religion. So we have to separate into, uh, unlike your friends, uh, you know, you have to be a little more fine-tuned about what religion, whether people have this religion or that religion. There's Sufi Islam, there, uh, there's branches of Sunni Islam in uh, Central Asia. So they have a lot of religion. But I would say one thing that um, uh, the uh, Shiite Islam, for example, doesn't have these properties. Right. They, 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 are, they follow the majority. They, they, they don't have minority rules. Right. Okay. So the, um, the, the minority rule, once visible, irritates people beyond measure. Right. Which, I mean, to put it in the terms that I said earlier, once Not it is above the just noticeable difference, the game exactly. is up. Exactly. So, uh, but, but the minority rule, uh, uh, you have to also be aware, plays on both sides. Right. And and, and often you, you're confused. But one, one more additional thing is since you're in consumer marketing, um, if you watch, uh, the, the, let's look at minority rule in this context. Uh, uh, most cars that you buy in America are uh, automatic shift, not stick shift. Right. Why is it so? Because at a time when they introduced these things, a family of four, one person doesn't drive stick shift. They have one car. Right. Okay. They're going to buy automatic. And this is how the thing spread. Very interesting. Uh, two, maybe two more things we could talk about, but uh, we want to keep the people coming. So we'll have many more of these conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first, this is for, in your past book, uh, Anti-Fragile. As I was, again, when I try to read your stuff, I right away try to think of links to evolutionary theories, since that's my, my area. Uh, and I was trying to think of whether there is some sort of taxonomy that allows us to predict which types of phenomena would benefit from anti-fragile properties versus those that wouldn't. And then, so I thought, of course, one of the th things that I study most is mating behavior. And so I thought, okay, well, we know that in human mating, we have what's called assortative mating, meaning that birds of a feather flock together. We know that if we try to predict the likelihood of success of a long-term union, people who are more similar to one another are more likely to stay together rather than if they complement, if they're opposite from each other. But from an anti-fragile perspective, you would argue that the chaos of being different from each other would be a good thing. So does anti-fragility work at all in the context yeah, of... Yeah, no, I, I've explained it. Uh, I've explained what I mean by anti-fragility in the same context, but let me give you a different one. Right. You need variation, but not too much, not too little. Mm. So let's uh, let's say let's talk about parthenogenesis, which is even step zero of evolution. Right. You know, okay. So you have one one organism, and okay, how do you have evolution? That organism produces copies of itself with some random error. The random error, it, you're convex to error. In other words, those with the positive error make it; those with a negative error don't make it. So you're just going to have some mutation towards you know uh, fitness in an environment. Okay. Now, let's say that the error rate is too low, you don't, you, you don't change, okay? If the error rate is too high, what happens? You change too much, you don't retain the advantage of the previous, okay? Right. So this is exactly the point about variation. You need to have a variance that is not too high and not too little. So in the specific context of whether yes. uh, people who are more alike tend to have more successful unions or not, are you saying that if they were too similar or or too dissimilar, that would be incorrect, but somewhere there's a happy medium in between? Exactly, exactly. And let me go one by one. If it's too similar, it's sort of like having, uh, uh, you know, producing, uh, it becomes incest. <laughs> it's a, it's a okay. clone of yourself. Okay, sorry, clone. All right, so it becomes pure. Uh, uh, what, uh, so it doesn't work. Okay, incest with a twin, uh, whatever. So with a pure, you know, equivalent. 
if you are, um, but now if you have too much variation, too much variety, then you the what happens is that you may have some payoff from that variety because you have offspring that of course will be stochastically dependent on either parents. So you have a lot of spreading. And, and then what happens is that the ones that are fit, you see, you have a variance that allows you to find the fitness of the one. Now, the problem with next generation, you see, you may not have be in that bandwidth. To, I don't know what terms you use for that. So it's exactly the same, as I mentioned earlier, with that error rate mm-hmm. in dimension two. Right. See, okay, so, so it's simple. Here we have two dimensions, the same problem. One is dimension zero or dimension one, to say. So what happens is that if you have too much mutation or if you have too much variance, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, so you need to be in the middle. Have enough variance, but not too much. And hence, hence the grandmother's uh, e- uh, axiom of everything in life in moderation, correct? Exactly. Not too much, not too little. But I mean, but enough variation. But then let's generalize uh, from that. Is that. People are for progress, okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm for, well, everybody should be for progress because nature is for progress, all right? So, the, 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 but at what rate do you want right. to change? If you change too fast, you don't retain the benefits of what you've changed. Right. So right. there is a, so in, in everything, there is a sweet side. The way I explain it best also in anti-fragile is as follows. Shocks and vari- variability are good for you, all right? So if I jump one meter, okay, I'm, my bones are going to get stronger. If I jump zero meters, my bone density will drop. Right. If I jump 10 meters, what happens? They break. I would, I would die, right? Yeah. So, so, so therefore, the, the sweet spot is between zero and two meters, maybe, whatever it is. By the way, it applies to, uh, say, personality traits. Take, for example, uh, perfectionism. If you're not sufficiently perfectionist, then your work might suffer. You're not conscientious. You're not detail-oriented. If you're too perfectionist, as I tend to suffer from that, then you become frozen in rechecking your work. Uh, Darwin forbid I may have a comma that's wrong somewhere, so I'll spend five hours rechecking my email to make sure that there's no error. So there is some sweet spot between the not, no f- perfectionism and too much perfectionism that is the right point. So it's the exact same idea. Yeah, it's exactly the same. So anti-fragile for, for a system is uh, benefiting from being convex, but you're never infinitely convex. You're convex within an S-curve typically. Right. Right, See, beautiful. you're complex with an S curve, so it's, it's only a, there's an S curve. Effectively, it's actually not just an S curve. Now we know it's an S curve. We we'll go back now. Right. So uh, the, la- part yes. L- last point, and then we'll uh, pick it up hopefully in many future chats. Uh, and and I love this that you cover rationality from an evolutionary perspective because I, I want to sort of set the ground for what we're going to talk about. So I, I came out, my, my doctoral training was very much within the behavioral decision theory, the Kahneman, Tversky, the, your friend, Richard Thaler, who was my professor at Cornell. Yes. Uh, so I very much came out of the, what, what, what some have called it myself, the violation of the month club, right? Here is yet another violation of how we're not as homo economicus tells us we are. And I became very frustrated. I mean, to me, it was like, I get it. There is a unicorn species that only exists in the deep recesses of the economist's mind. We don't act like them. Let's move on. Let's study why the human brain has evolved to be the way that it is. And that's how I then became an evolutionist. Uh, So in your case, you exactly incorporate the correct idea of rationality, which is to root it in evolutionary theory. So it's ecological rationality, as compared to normative rationality. Maybe you could talk about this. Yes, okay. I mean, I, I, I've learned a lot from people I'm sure you know. I saw your picture at the center where I was a visitor as well in the Max Planck Institute. Max Planck Institute. Before, <laughs> I need to interrupt you before you go on. What if the year? When I was at Max Planck and I was asked to uh, write something for that photo, you know, in that great wall of people, yeah. uh, the, the, the guy who asked me, of course, I met... Uh, the guy was Gerd Gigerenzer and Peter Todd. So Peter Todd asks me to go in a room so that I can write some some lines to sort of immortalize my visit. And I, you know, I do something very quickly. Then he comes back to me very politely as Peter Peter is. And he goes, you realize this is going to be on the wall forever, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, okay, so you're basically saying that what I just wrote sucks and I need to think about it. He goes, yes, please. So that's the story, but go on. Okay, so, so I saw your picture there. 
and uh, and and so I've been a visitor uh, of that group, and to inform our uh, uh, you know the, the people viewers what it is, it's uh, it's a different behavior by looking at rationality in terms of evolutionary traits in an ecological environment, not narrowed down um, laboratory style. So I worked a lot with GERD, and uh, the the. The, but the, the quantum leap I took was one day I was invited for a retreat in a German town. I forgot the name, but it's supposedly the one that doesn't exist. Uh, there's a conspiracy about it. Is this uh, the Max Planck uh, castle? No, 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 no. Oh. There's, it's a, uh, there's a, a city called uh, something that's supposed to be, there's a conspiracy, it doesn't exist. So Because nobody goes there, and effectively there's nothing there. So I went for four days uh, with Gerge Grenzer, and there was a fellow who has really put the, 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 the foundations of, of rationality. Okay, and his name is Ken Ben Moore. Probably, you know, it's like a giant, okay, a mathematician. Uh, he did, does game theory, and there were other people in game theory. So that was my jump. My jump is looking at how, you know, effectively uh, orthodox economics define rationality. They don't, it's not an accounting trick. They don't. They don't even ask for it. It just asks you to be coherent. That's it. Right. And even they can tolerate within the norms of rationality. Okay. It is effectively irrational to confuse rationality with first order uh, uh, logic, right? Because you have to put the background. It, it's within the foundation. And he said that it's not irrational to give your coat to a random person walking by if that's what you think your mission in life is to do. Right. So he reconciled all these things from narrow accounting and, and, and all these attacks on rationality. But what I took away from him is effectively the notion of revelation of preferences. Okay, that, effect, that, that when you deal with rationality, and, and that was his idea, you should absolutely ignore what people are saying because that's background furniture. Right. So if you, you, you say, oh, Darwin, maybe your form of theology, I use Baal, all right? <laughs> but the fact is you shouldn't observe it. You should observe what people do. Right. So I then came back and wrote that chapter on the Pope, where I said that the Pope is as atheist as they come, because what, what matters, according to these people, is not whether you believe or don't believe, is how you act in, 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 in regular life. Okay. In regular life, when the Pope is shot, he doesn't really invoke the supernatural immediately. He goes first to the hospital. <laughs> and that's why I looked and here and I made the basis of a difference between atheism and secularism. You see, is that the fact the difference between them is not, and, and this is one thing, this is why I don't like your friends. Um, it, 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 the, 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 what you say should never be taken literally because it has no value. Uh, you know that from consumers, what people pay that matters, that's what you do. If you analyze preferences revealed in actions and just actions, and then look at consistency and consistency in, uh, in action, you will see absolutely no difference between atheist and secularist. Right. So hence that distinction is just background furniture. I observe Lent, I go to church, I pray, but in my behavior, and I think that you're an atheist or something like that, whatever you call yourself, but in our behavior, when, when we are walking down the street, we do the same thing. Right. And they're basically indistinguishable. And I say, when I'm in church, the other person is at a concert. <laughs> okay. All right. And then, and uh, so I, this is where the preference revealed. So, but it took me even one step further into religion. Is that effectively religion only exists when you have sacrifice for it. Right. Otherwise you're an atheist. And, and, and you know, the gods, Baal and our gods, uh, long before monotheism came, they, they didn't care. You believe in them. They wanted you to give them 30% of your land, this, 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 that's it. The religion was sacrifice. It's just like the I love you doesn't count, all right? You need an engagement ring, costly signal ring. Exactly. Signal. So you go back to religion. So to me, anything that doesn't have any costly signal ring is indistinguishable from atheism, from that, that standpoint of preferences revealed, so, you see? So, so therefore, what you guys call atheism, all right, is or is and secularism from a standpoint of except for some whatever behavior is I see very little difference. So let me ask you this: since we're talking about religion, it's it's tough to not go down that trajectory for a few minutes. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, there are 
several theories that have been proposed to explain why religion exists. And so I'll mention two very brief ones, and then and then you'll tell me if either of them strike a chord with you. And I, I, have, a, I have a sense that I can predict which one you probably feel uh, more comfortable with. So uh, religion as an adaptation would basically argue that, look, there are, there are adaptive Val- there's an adaptive value to being religious. So that's the argument of David Sloan Wilson. Using a group selectionist argument, he basically will say, look, a religious group has greater communality, greater cohesion, greater in-group, out-group distinction. That results in that group out-surviving a group that doesn't, ha- that doesn't have religiosity. Another group of evolutionists like Pascal Boyer, who was also on, on my show, and David Sloan Wilson is a good friend, Pascal Boyer argues, no, religion is an exaptation. It's a byproduct. It piggybacks on neural mechanisms that existed for another purpose, agency detection, tribal coalitional thinking. So these systems existed and then they're parasitized by religion. So is your view that religion is adaptive or exaptive? I, I think the first one. That's what I what, thought you would say, okay. From a standpoint of survival and also from a standpoint of more like a mathematization of a process, effectively, you know, you and I know that what will make us survive is the tr- that move survive several hundred million years. Okay, so there's a lot of large numbers uh, uh, involved. It's traits that are convex to errors. Okay, in other words, paranoia and stuff. And these uh, can only be through interdicts. Okay, and interdict, okay, can only be conveyed through religion. Let me give you an example. Uh, you you can, what I said is, if you're halal or, or if you're uh, kosher, you can say, I'm kosher because I only eat very little, uh, uh, but I only eat very little pork. I don't eat a lot. You can't say that. There's no low-carb diet equivalent. Things come in block. And then the, the interdicts, and you don't have to explain an interdict. You just take it in block, all right? So these are two conditions, block and interdict. So therefore, that's the only way to transmit risk management interdicts and rules through generations. But could, could so, for, so for example, in the consuming instinct, I talk about, I offer a, by a lot, using the lens of today's understanding of, you know, pathogens, I yeah. explain how, let's say, the kosher edict of eating, of not eating shellfish, uh, you know, or clams or whatever, uh, would, would have, you know, would have solved a very important biological problem, which is there is no I, way. I, I disagreed uh, with that. Okay, why is that? Okay, I said like the 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 fact is kosher. Uh, you have five hundred some dietary rules, and if you take Maimonides, they tell you okay that pork. We don't know that it's not necessarily for health. I think it's a social marker, having entered it. It's also signaling. In other words, the Jews band together because it's almost impossible for a Jew to eat with a non-Jew if you have 500 dietary laws. So might it be the case that different rules of purity and diet serve different adaptive functions? Some I, don't, of I, don't, the... I think maybe, maybe, but, but, but the way I look at it is I look at the success of Jews came from two things. They band together and they have colonies. Think about it. If I'm going to go to Marseille and I eat kosher, it's impossible for me you know, uh, 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 unless there's a, a, a community there. Mm. So you go from Jewish community to Jewish community. And then I think it, it did, given that you're both Phoenician and uh, uh, Judean, it did, uh, uh, and, and Judeans and Phoenicians were the same, same language, okay, if not the same uh, stock. They, they, they started going to that Phoenician colonies and, and, and going. That's the first one. The second one is, is quite central. Think about uh, uh, what would have happened if uh, Jews could mix, you see? So this is why interdicts are very good for that. And, 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 and I've read a lot in the literature that what, what happened to um, uh, uh, Islamic travelers, right? right? They didn't have a colony. They couldn't, go to the, they couldn't go to France. So they couldn't eat halal and they couldn't travel. So mm-hmm. hence my, my, my ancestors were, were merchants going to the West because they could go to the West. They didn't, didn't have a problem. And, and, and it's quite another interesting, very interesting thing is that when you look at prohibition against alcohol, it's not clear in Islam. And I think they made it to prevent socialization with you guys. Now, do you think that as, or, they, as they get these revelations or these edicts, that they actually know the earthly reasons? No, 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 no. Oh, so they, they genuinely believe that they are divinely ordained? have random rules, people have random rules, and those who have the right rules survive. But the, the point is, again, I mean, this whole notion of ex-ante rationality doesn't exist. It's exposed. 
-hmm. is people have uh, uh, some weird things that you don't quite understand, not consciously, it's too complex. That's ecological rationality. Just those who have the randomly, you know, that random property. This is why you should not never throw the baby with the bathwater. Right. The, the other thing I have is that anyone, I'm going to say it bluntly, anyone who thinks that religious beliefs are epistemic knows nothing about religion and knows nothing about science. <laughs> They're not epistemic, you see. The, the difference is scientific statement is literal and should be there not to allow you to survive or allow you to die. It should be there for its truth value, period. So that, that, does, that, does that sound like, uh, so Stephen Jay Gould talks about the NOMA principle. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what that is? Yes. Uh, good, so yeah. the, NOMA, the NOMA principle is non-overlapping magisteria. So he, so he, he was, if you like, uh, conciliatory. He's saying, look, that there are there are certain things that we get f uniquely from religion, and there are other things that we get from science. We don't need to pit them against one another, and hence they are noma, non-overlapping magisteria. Yeah. So what you're what you're saying seems to uh, at least coincide with with his position. No, actually, no, I, I have actually much more brutal difference. Okay, okay. what we have is what I say. Science doesn't make any religious claims. Science is about what is scientific. It's the application of science. People apply science, but science doesn't tell you how to eat. Science is about epistemic statements, purely epistemic. It doesn't tell you how to eat, how to behave, what to do, what to do, moral. It doesn't tell you, okay? Decision-making, all right, okay, is different. Decision-making is risk management. So the way you layer it is that science is a statistical statement that needs to remain and, and be as literal and statistical and rigorous as you can. And it's very unrigorous. And if you start taking, I mean, I was very influenced by Ken Binmore when I figured out that, uh, and, and again, that's not what I got from him directly, but when I figured out that if you go back, reread the economics, they're not making these statements that people claim they're making. Well, it's the same thing with, uh, with science. Right. So looking at the science doesn't make these claims. They're, fine. they're making claims that if you do this, do this, and it works all times. That's it. Right? They're not making claims about how you should uh, uh, behave, whether you should believe this or that. That's a re preferences revealed. So basic. So, but science doesn't have preferences revealed. So that Sci that, that speaks, I guess, to uh, in decision making. You talk about the difference between normative decision making, the homo economicus stuff, prescriptive decision making. This is operations research, the traveling salesman problem. If you yeah. want to minimize or optimize something, do X, Y, Z. And, and descriptive decision making, which simply describes behavior as a psychologist would. So in a sense, you seem to be following that kind of taxonomy where, you know, depending, science might fall into one and religion falls into another. One is normative, one is prescriptive, one is descriptive. Is that, does that seem fair? Uh, uh, I, I didn't follow these because uh, given that I'm in decision science myself, sort of like sort of, sort of what I work with, so statistical decision science. And then uh, describe it this way. And then there's a, te a technicity that effectively destroys behavioral economics. Right. The technicity is that they think that if you start saying that, that we should understand the world without a mistake, I'm going to give you a thought experiment. Okay. You make mistakes. It's mistakes are not free. And that's sort of like the idea of an anti-fragile that I further discuss in the game. If you, God said, have an appointment tomorrow with the most important point in your life. Okay. Uh, thing in your life at 9 a.m. Okay, when should you get there? A few minutes earlier. Well, okay, there you go. So, so if you make a mistake in getting there, you'd rather be earlier than late. Right. So some mistakes are good. Some mistakes are bad. Okay. So if a plane, a plane cannot afford to make some class of mistakes. Right. Crisis. All right. So, so the, the the point is, and this is what your uh, evolutionary, not evolutionary, your behavioral finance uh, Taylor types don't get. Right. That right. that overestimating small probabilities is a necessity to survive. Right. Just like getting getting ten minutes earlier for your flight, two hours. We we'll make a sketch two hours earlier. Uh, you know, earlier. You should be do ten minutes because that's what it takes. You know, an ideal thing. It takes ten minutes. You know. So that's it. Under stochastic environments. You have to have some biases, right? And, and these are not biases; they are necessary. Uh, so you start eliminating all the theories doing that dynamically, particularly. And then the second statement is that they think they give you uh, a cigarette, 
okay? And then they tell you, uh, you smoke a cigarette, uh, you derive this pleasure, it costs you so much in risk, okay? And it's foolish to overestimate the risk of cigarettes. Right. Okay, but we know that you, you don't smoke cigarette once, you smoke. So they don't do one experiment, oh, you overestimate the losses of money. Yeah, but if I don't do that, I'll go bankrupt. <laughs> in a dynamic framework so they don't understand dynamic framework so this book the last chapter which to me is the most important probably the most important thing i've written because synthesis of everything i've written it's called it's called the logic of risk taking very simple logic of risk taking yeah no no i'm looking at the name of the chat the 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 the, 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 the logic it was called logic of risk bearing of course i was just verifying Logic of risk taking, and that logic of risk taking is about this. And there's something called ergodicity. Right. right. In other words, when you, you put time into it. <laughs> Thank you very much for. Habibi, uh, maybe shaba minnak. We were supposed to only speak for 20 minutes, but I told you that there's no way to only last 20 minutes with the godliness himself. Uh, Thank you, your godliness, for <laughs> for your generosity, intellect, and remarkable. Um, uh, 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 erudition. Erudition for us, listen, for us and my family, I'm sure probably, is vastly more important than intellect. كثير كثير لازم حبيبي. لازم اجي ازورك بنيويورك لان مشتاق لك. انت معزوم. شكرا حبيبي. شكرا حبيبي. ضلك ضلك على الخط دقيقة. Yeah, sorry visitors were speaking Phoenicians. Cheers.